Well, I, I suppose one of the things that surprised me was here was a man who was probably uh, the father of broadcast journalism. He was out front, first in, in, in radio reporting, radio analysis, and, and then in television. Uh, the, I would have thought that he would have been a man uh, enjoying his success. He was a very tortured soul, never felt that anything he did was up to snuff. He was a, not an easy person to get along with. And that kind of surprised me. And also I uh, was a little surprised by the burning ambition in the man. He, that didn't show externally, but uh, uh, here's Ed, Ed Murrow, a, a monument to truth in broadcasting, and that's the way I look at him. But at one time he, f he fudged his resume so that he appeared to have been a graduate of a place more prestigious than the Cow College that he went to in the state of Washington. And uh, he wanted to appear more mature and he added four years to his age. And I thought, what, a, what an irony that is, that this man who's this pillar of integrity in his professional expression would play these little bit of games to advance himself. And I didn't think it was all that bad. Writing the Murrow book was very rewarding in that I got to talk to people who are, or were, professional talkers, and who were among the best professional talkers in the country. I mean, I spent hours with Eric Severide, Charles Collingwood, Howard K. Smith, and on and on and on. It was just a pleasure to talk to these people. They were all very articulate, had something to say, and I just sat there and enjoyed it. Murrow wanted to take on McCarthy when McCarthy was just terrorizing the country, destroying the lives and careers of many people who were utterly innocent. So he and Fred Friendly uh, decided to do a um, program on See It Now, their pioneer documentary series on McCarthy. And they did something very clever. They did two things very clever. The first of which was they did not attack McCarthy they did not mount uh, a campaign against him. They just, for the most part, ran clips of McCarthy. And M McCarthy, in his performance in congressional hearings and in other settings, was a pretty ugly character. And I'm talking about in terms of, of his conduct, his bullying ways. So that uh, what they did was fashion a rope and let McCarthy hang himself. But McCarthy wanted equal time. And so they only too happily gave him equal time. And he came on and he had his half hour. And he was, had makeup on that looked like he'd just been taken care of by a discount mortician. He, <laughs> he looked just awful. He looked just awful. And that, he completed his own execution. So it was brilliant the way that they stage managed that. Well, the most interesting, interesting thing he said uh, related to the fact that Murrow then a, a radio correspondent, the chief CBS radio correspondent, during the war years in London, repeatedly insisted on going on bombing raids and, and giving marvelous reports, eyewitness accounts of what it was like these thousand plane raids on German cities. And Paley uh, said to Merle, look, you did it once, you did it twice, you got the story. Why do you keep doing this? So I asked Paley, I said, why did he do it? He said that uh, this man had a death wish. And uh, that fit in with this rather macabre, gloomy outlook on, on, on Merle's life. And it was an insight for me to talk to Paley on that score. Uh, when I grew up, as I mentioned, in upstate New York, there were three figures that I thought would be changeless. One was the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, who had been President as long as I could remember. The other was Governor Dewey, who seemed to be Governor forever, and then the Mayor of New York City, Fiorello LaGuardia. This was like a constellation which I thought was immutable, proved not to be obviously the case. But uh, Roosevelt was, was my hero as a kid, and uh, again, as I mentioned with Nuremberg, I always wanted to write something about him and finally got around to doing it about four or five years ago and Roosevelt's secret war was the product. Well, f first of all, uh, what's, what's interesting is that uh, the United States had never had a professional intelligence service. Almost every other country on earth had uh, had such a service, usually going back 
couple of hundred years or in Britain for, for at least 400 years. So Roosevelt was the father of intelligence operations when he named Bill uh, Donovan to create the Office of Strategic Services. Uh, beyond that, uh, he was also deeply involved as a recipient of interceptions. And to me, this was, this was fascinating. We were intercepting the Japanese diplomatic code in World War II, almost from the inception. Navy code breakers have broken the Japanese code. And so we're intercepting these. So I was at the uh, National Archives, and I was dipping in to these codes. And, and I found uh, that the uh, American cryptologists intercept, for example, a message which reported a conversation between Hitler and the Japanese ambassador. Hitler would call in the Japanese ambassador and he would say, the Allies are intending to invade Europe. Here is how we are going to repel them. So many divisions here. Uh, we're going to strengthen this wall there. We are anticipating that the invasion will take place in such a part of France. So the Japanese ambassador, being a good diplomat, would go back to his embassy and he would report to Tokyo on the Foreign Office what Hitler's plans were for repelling D-Day in effect. We're breaking the code, so we now know about this conversation between these two people, and this information would wind up on the desk of Franklin Roosevelt. So I dealt with matters like that in the course of this book. Uh, a number of revisionists, historians, who have said Roosevelt knew all about this, and he let it happen so that the United States would go into the war. Uh, I, I found the actual uh, interviews of some of these people, when you read them closely, that was not what happened at all. That was uh, not what was said. Now, every time I would be interviewed about the Roosevelt uh, book, Roosevelt Secret War, everywhere, every station that I went to, radio, television, newspaper, whatever, inevitably I would be asked about this controversy. And uh, I'm not going to take a, a great deal of time here explaining, but it's rubbish. Roosevelt did not want to get into a war with Japan. He wanted to get into a war against Nazi Germany alongside the British. And uh, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor just made it inevitable that we would have to have a war on two fronts. How did I wind up working with Colin Powell on his autobiography? I was finishing up Nuremberg Infamy on Trial. And uh, I had a literary agent he said, well, what are you going to do now? I said, I, I haven't got another thought. He said, well, Colin Powell is doing his autobiography and he wants a collaborator and he's turned down a number of people. So he said, why don't we th throw your pen in the ring? I said, okay. So uh, I finally wound up meeting Colin Powell on his last day after 35 years in the Army. I went to his office. He was then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff went to him and talked with him only for about half an hour or so. And he said, he said to me, uh, well, uh, I'm talking to other people. I'll let you know what I decide. So about a week went by. So I went back to putting the finishing touches on Nuremberg. And the phone rings. And I hear this crackling noise. And somebody saying, Persico, you talk, book, autobook. I couldn't figure out what in the hell this was. And then I realized this guy is finally a civilian and he's trying to use a car phone. And before, he's had flunkies to take care of his phone calls and he doesn't know how to do it. And then all of a sudden I heard bang. And I thought, he's in his car and he's hit a tree. <laughs> and that's the end of the collaboration. But then about a half an hour later, he, he called from his home and said, I'm sorry, I didn't really know how to work this stuff. <laughs> but would you collaborate with me? And that's how it began. When I uh, f came back from this visit to him in the Pentagon, my wife Sylvia said, well, wh what's this guy like? And I said, he is the most comfortable man in his skin who I have ever met. I've never met anybody who was more at peace with himself, knew what he was, wasn't trying to impress me or cow somebody or show how much he knew. He was just a, a very genuine human being and, and still is.